It's a theme as old as money itself, the struggle between the rich and the poor. And it became especially apparent after the financial crisis. People were losing money hand over fist in the market, millions lost their jobs and their homes. Trust in Wall Street was at its lowest point in memory. People were protesting in the streets. One company launched a stock trading app in the shadow of the crisis, Robinhood. Named after the English fairy tale character who took from the rich and gave to the poor. Good swordsmen, good archers, good fighters. Are you with me? But those guys didn't start a $5.6 billion company. These guys did. It's an eye-popping valuation for a financial company with opaque metrics and plenty of competition. The young company had its share of missteps as well. Too good to be true? Well, for Robinhood, that might be the case. We know that this practice is highly criticized, not only from regulators, but also from consumer advocates. They say that they were inspired by the financial crisis and all that. Well, guess what? They're getting a huge chunk of their revenue from <laughs> high-frequency trading. Prompting questions over whether or not they can handle prime time. But let's go back to the beginning. Today's Robinhood, the app, is founded by two people who were fed up with the way you had to trade. Or at least they knew others were fed up. We're focused on building an awesome user experience. Onboarding something like 150,000 customers in such a short period of time is, is pretty much unprecedented in, in the brokerage industry. The cost to trade had come down so far in the last 20 years since online trading began, why not make it free? Now, if you want to invest in the stock market without paying fees, there's an app for that. Since Robinhood came into the App Store, we've saved customers over $5 million in commissions. All in the theme of sticking it to the banks. The mission of Robinhood is to democratize America's financial system. But there was something else that made this product work. We were already addicted to our phones. Robinhood made trading easy on the device we were looking at all day. The combination, incredible growth. The company launched in 2013. Just over a year later, they had hundreds of thousands of people on a waiting list. The beginning of 2018, they had 3 million customers. By the end of that year, they had doubled that amount to 6 million users. The darling of FinTech. Many believe the company is revolutionary. Where they are, really groundbreaking is how fast they're moving and how much they're pushing the envelope. You know, they can't be dismissed because there is something in being able to double time and time again where clearly you're resonating with consumers. And then the speed at which they're offering new types of capabilities, I don't think any of the incumbents could move that fast. But there are questions about how much money is really in the accounts. Robinhood gets a lot of attention because the account growth has been really impressive yeah. and everything like that, but there's very little money there. With Schwab Ameritrade, we have larger accounts, accounts that are in hundreds of thousands, not single-digit thousands on average, which is the last time we looked at Robinhood. A JMP analysis estimates the average assets in Robinhood accounts to be one to $5,000. That's compared to 100000 for Fidelity, 110,000 for TD Ameritrade, and about 240,000 for Charles Schwab. Robinhood would not disclose account values when asked by CNBC. We don't know exactly where uh, the account sizes are. Uh, I suspect that based on the types of accounts, they're, they're typically lower asset accounts. And so they're gonna be less profitable today, uh, but I think probably one of the key things to think about is that a small account today could be a large account in the future, especially if you're getting to uh, the customer when they're young or early in their financial life. Not only could they take on brokers like TD Ameritrade and Charles Schwab, they might just challenge the big banks too. Especially as you add more capabilities and more service and then service the cash of the account, hopefully you have an opportunity to compete for a higher percentage of the wallet, which some of the big incumbents are, are doing quite well today. There are also other startups trying to take advantage of this trend. A slew of investing-oriented apps have come on the market in the last few years, including Betterment, Acorns, Stash, and more. But it is not as easy to take the Silicon Valley approach of moving fast and breaking things in fintech. There are plenty of competitors with really deep pockets and, of course, tons and tons of regulation. Some have called out a hypocritical side to the fintech unicorn that makes it not so different from old school Wall Street. 
In October, Bloomberg reported that the company gets almost half of its revenue through a practice called payment for order flow, meaning a company is paying Robinhood to be the other side of your trade on the platform or at least get the first right of refusal. It's a controversial practice, but commonplace among online brokers. It means your orders aren't happening on a public exchange, but behind closed doors in a dark pool. Some say it helps market efficiencies because companies invest in making faster trades. Others say it's just a way for high-speed computerized traders to skim off every trade, keeping markets opaque. The SEC has proposed a pilot program to look into the practice. There's a concern maybe it's taking advantage. The arguments are it improves liquidity, that it takes what would be a small trade and uh, aggregates it and allows it to get a better execution quality. The reason to run a pilot is to make sure that those claims are all actually valid. Robinhood would not disclose how much it makes from this practice to CNBC, but the company did offer an explanation of the system on its website, saying, We send your orders to market makers that allow you to receive better execution quality and better prices. The revenue we receive helps us cover the cost of operating our business and allows us to offer you commission-free trading. The question is, can a company that built a name literally on fairness convince its customers it's on their side? One way to do it is to offer better interest rates, and that's exactly what Robinhood tried to do. In December, the company announced 3% checking and savings accounts. Compare that to the national average of 0.09% offered by most savings accounts. For the median American house that's got about $8,000 in the bank, this adds up to a staggering $240 a year. Except the company isn't a bank. The move ended up being a fiasco. There are a lot of concerns about masquerading as a bank. Banks are tightly regulated in this country. And so if you have something that doesn't have the sort of safeguards put in place around those operations and you try and present yourself as a bank, they're not going to allow for that. So I reached out to Robinhood. They wouldn't provide any details about the potential relaunch of the cash management account. They pointed me to a blog post and said to stay tuned. On top of all of that, the market may be turning. While accounts were almost surely growing with the broader stock market for years, millennials, already scarred by entering the job market during the financial crisis, have now gotten just a taste of their first bear market. Robinhood gained millions of users just after announcing you could trade cryptocurrencies on the platform in early 2018. But for the people who invested in Bitcoin the day the company started allowing crypto trades, things probably aren't looking so great. They lost almost two-thirds of their money by the end of the year. At the same time, a younger generation of traders may be willing to stomach more risk, and volatile markets could be an opportunity for Robinhood. When times are volatile, consumers typically um, look for help, or they look for more types of professional capabilities. So volatility in the moment can be chilling and can be startling to the customer, but it tends to actually uh, accelerate growth. So what's next for Robinhood? The company claims its users have transacted over $150 billion on the platform and saved over a billion in commission fees as of May 2018. It's beefing up its executive staff, hiring an Amazon veteran as its first CFO as it tiptoes towards an IPO. It's not like Robinhood hasn't faced challenges before. We'll see if today's financial product can live up to the legend.